Since 1887, the Stonington Free Library has been a center for knowledge, ideas, creativity, and entertainment. It is a comfortable and welcoming community space for the town of Stonington, Connecticut, where all ages can explore, discover, gather and learn within a building of distinctive and unique architecture. This video program is an evolution to expand the offerings of the library to share directly in your home or organization. Welcome to the Sunday Evening Lecture Series made available to you by the Stonington Free Library.
years old and nearing the peak of her celebrity. Performing as the French chef, she won an Emmy Award and appeared on the cover of Time magazine. She had co-authored two volumes of Master of the Art of French Cooking. Flinging baguettes, slapping eggplants, Julia, as everybody called her, was a natural on television, an unpretentious culinary guy who instructed and enchanted the country. In France, however, the French chef was virtually unknown, which was just how she liked it. The child had built a small house outside of Cannes called La Pichoune, which means the little thing. It was their private hideaway, where they went to exhale and rejuvenate. Paul would write, photograph, and garden. Julia would sleep, cook, and truffle hunt, as she'd say, through restaurants and markets in search of new recipes and ingredients. It was a familiar pattern, and in the summer of 1976, they invited my family to join them. My parents, sisters, and I flew to Nice, rented a small olive green car, and drove up and down winding roads to La Beach. When we arrived that evening, Julia and Paul greeted us with a succulent leg of lamb and a steaming platter of ratatouille. Though they had never had children, they tried, but it didn't take, Julia said. They welcomed us as surrogate grandchildren. We had been lucky to spend time with them in Cambridge, in Maine, in New York, but this was our first trip to France. And we were a bit nervous, in part because of Paul. Here we lodge those on foot, on horse. 
horseback or with paintings. Inside, the rustic walls were decorated with a remarkable collection by starving artists who had traded their work for food and lodging. Leger, there we go, Leger, Picasso, Brock, Chagall, Calder, and others. Perhaps it was the proximity to such master works, the familial, the familial warmth, the food and wine, or some other mysterious trigger. But Paul suddenly grew animated. He smiled, regaled us with tales of the Saracen pirates, and encouraged me to try a glass of rosé. It was as if my grumpy granduncle had reverted to his charming pre-bypass self. You can see me there in the back next to Julia with my long hair and, and acne. <laughs> a few days later, we gathered in the child's stone terrace on a hot, still evening. As the sun faded, Julia hummed to herself and steeped chicken in a fantastic marinade, then grilled it one sizzling piece at a time on a tiny hibachi in the corner. Paul set a small black and white TV on a, a, a wobbly chair, and we turned on the Summer Olympics then underway in Montreal. As the graceful Cuban heavyweight to go Philip Stevenson battled Romania's Merche Chimon, Paul jabbed the air and translated the play-by-play -play from French into English with growing excitement. When Stevenson knocked out Chimon to win the gold, we stood to hoot and holler. Paul was so animated and Julian's chicken was so delicious that the evening lingers even now. Paul would later suffer a series of strokes which left him confused and sedentary. Those days at La Peach were the last glimpse I had of the genuine Paul child. Julia, meanwhile, was forging a dynamic new career path in which she left behind French cuisine and the French chef to cook recipes from around the world and re-Americanize herself as Julia Child. In retrospect, that summer of 1976 was a transformative moment for Julia every bit as significant as the fall of 1948 when she first stepped onto French soil and ate a life-changing meal of Sol Manier. Though I was present at Julia's second transformation, it would take me another 40 years to appreciate just how profound it was. Paul and Julia met in Sri Lanka during World War II. They married in Pennsylvania in 1946 and landed in France on November 3, 1948. They packed their big blue Buick station wagon, the Blue Flash, to the rafters with their baggage and drove from the port of Le Havre to Paris. There, Paul worked at the U.S. Embassy as a cultural attaché. After some trial and error, Julia found her life's calling in La Cuisine Française, experienced a flowering of the soul, and over the next five years, morphed from a too tall, too loud social butterfly, as she described herself, into a worldly sophisticate. An obscure diplomatic wife at the time, she toiled for years with her French friends, Cynthia Cabet and Louisette Bertol, on their first cookbook, Mastering the Art of French Cooking. This was Julia's gestational period, when she was in her 30s and 40s. I think of it as Act One of her adult life, and I helped her write about it in her memoir, My Life in France. Julia died in 2004, uh, halfway through the writing of that book, and I had to finish it myself. But I had the great privilege of working with her editor at Knopf, the legendary Judith B. Jones, who just recently passed away at the age of 93. My Life in France was published in 2006, and in 2009 it inspired half the film Julie and Julia, starring one of Julia's favorite actresses, Meryl Streep. In the meantime, I moved on to write about other things. A book about the benefits and problems of hydrofracking, for example, and The Ripple Effect, a book about why fresh water will be the defining resource of this century. Yet, even as I grappled with the problems of flood, drought, and pollution, and solutions to those challenges, a few tantalizing questions about Julia and Paul lingered in the back of my mind. What was it like for them to 
resettled in Massachusetts after living an exciting life abroad for over a dozen years, I wondered. How did Julia become America's premier cookbook author and first celebrity TV chef so quickly? And what was Paul doing once he retired? So a decade after writing her memoir, I circled back to look for answers. I plan to write an article or maybe make a short documentary film. But as I unearthed forgotten letters, interviewed the child's neighbors, and watched TV clips that hadn't been seen for 45 years, a hidden history of the child's began to emerge from the drifting piles of notes I accumulated. I realized that the 1970s was a remarkably productive decade, a time when Julia created books and TV shows unlike anything she'd done before. She reached the zenith of her success in those days, and she suffered her darkest moments in private. Noticing a pattern, I saw her overcome obstacle after obstacle in her personal and professional lives, which revealed another aspect of Julia's personality, how tough and resilient she could be, and how her optimism carried her and Paul through. At this point, Julia finally discovered her true voice. I came to think of this period as Julia's second act, when she was in her 50s and 60s. If her first act in France was a kind of fairy tale, then her second act in America was a drama, with higher highs and lower lows. With this insight, I realized I had far too much material for an article. So I sat down to write this book, The French Chef in America, Julia Child's Second Act. Now, one of the first things I asked myself was, what was the state of cookery on television when Julia arrived in our living rooms seemingly out of nowhere in the early 60s and changed the way we thought about food? Well, it turns out she was hardly the first TV chef. Americans had been cooking on the tube since the 1940s, at the dawn of the TV age. In 1946, for instance, James Beard hosted I Love to Eat, an aptly titled show on NBC. In the 50s, oops. Uh, I'm missing my slide here. Okay, there's James Beard, sorry about that. Uh, in the 50s, there were dozens of local programs across the country. Mary Wilson's Pots, Pans, and Personalities Marjorie Hume's What's Cooking, the blind Mexican chef Elena Zavieta, and the opera singing chef Eno Bontompi. The comic Ernie Kovacs hosted Deadline for Dinner, which he pronounced Dead Lion for Dinner. <laughs> While Lucille Ball locked herself in the fridge and stuffed herself with chocolate truffles. The Childs were oblivious to all of this. In the 1950s, they were diplomats, living in Germany and Norway, and they didn't even own a television set. But in 1961, they retired and settled into a large, gray flattered house behind Harvard Yard. That October, Knopf published Mastering the Art of French Cooking. In early 1962, Julia appeared on a local program called I've Been Reading on WGBH, Boston's then new PBS station. Now, this being Julia, she didn't just bring her book, she also brought a hot plate, a dozen eggs, plenty of butter, and proceeded to make an omelet. In fact, she was so intent on her cooking that she forgot to mention the title of her book. <laughs> the good news was that all 27 people who watched that night wrote in to say, we want more of that tall lady cooking. <laughs> this was considered a remarkable response. So Julia shot three pilot or test shows. After the Coco Van episode uh, about chicken stew, a viewer named Irene McHogue wrote in to say, Not only did I get a wonderfully refreshing new approach to the preparation and cooking of said poultry, but really and truly one of the most surprisingly entertaining half hours I've ever spent before the TV in many a moon. I loved the way she projected over the camera directly to me, the watcher. Loved watching her catch the frying pan as it almost went off the counter. <laughs> Loved her looking for the cover of the casserole. It was 
fascinating to watch her hand motions, which were so firm and short with the food, and her to-do about the brand new firing was without parallel for that rare tongue-in-cheek sort of humor that you were long for in this day of the over-rehearsed ad-lib. Bear in mind, this was Julia's second time on television, so she was off to a good start. In February of 1963, WGBH debuted The French Chef. It was made on a shoestring, shot on a borrowed set, with bound theme music, and cookware loaned by the store design research. Almost immediately, Julia grabbed the public's attention. She made you feel as if you were standing right there in the kitchen with her, as she grumbled that potatoes are nearby vegetables, smooshed a collapsing dessert together with her long fingers, and even brushed the teeth of a roast suckling pig. <laughs> there was simply no one like her on the television, and plenty of people who didn't cook at all tuned in to watch what she would do next. Julia explained the method to her madness this way. The idea was to take the bugaboo out of French cooking to demonstrate that it's not merely good cooking, but that it follows definite rules, Julia said. One of the secrets of cooking is to learn to correct something if you can, and bear with it if you cannot. There was something intimate and subverbal, even primal, about the experience of watching Julia cook. Her food was so lovingly portrayed that there are moments, even now, when it transports you. Julia liked to point the TV camera straight down into a pot of softly bubbling boeuf bourguignon to show you what it should look like as it cooked. It was instructive, but it also activated your taste buds and tempted you to dive right through the screen to dig into a heaping bowl of that succulent comfort food. To do that is not easy, observes the chef Jacques Pepin. She had a very rare quality. An important, if little remarked upon, aspect of the French chef was the implied narrative of each episode. From Julia's often humorous opening, Julia Child presents the Chicken Sisters. <laughs> Through the instruction to the triumphal digestion of a meal, while TV chefs like James Beard and Dion Lucas would end their shows by holding up their handiwork for the camera's clinical inspection, Julia would proudly march a pot of ratatouille from the kitchen to the dining room set, bearing the finished dish like rubies on velvet, the New York Times noted placed it on a table decorated with actual candles and real silverware, pour a glass of fake wine, serve herself a plate full of the vegetable melange, and dig in with palpable hunger. This seemingly logical coda to a cooking show was, in, was an innovation. It completed the journey of the meal from conception to creation to consumption. The audience responded viscerally. You are a delight, wrote housewives, hippies, taxi drivers, MIT scientists, and Wall Street bankers. The friendship was, quote, educational TV's answer to underground movie and pop pop cults, wrote the New York Times Magazine. The program can be campier than Batman, farther out than lost in space, and more penetrating than meet the press as it probes the question, can a society be great if its bread tastes like Kleenex? <laughs> In 1970, Julia and her French friend, in Quebec, struggled to finish Mastering the Art, Volume 2. It was full of ambitious recipes, like how to bake a baguette in your home kitchen, or this one, Loup de Mer en Croute, a sea bass and a pastry crust. But the creative tension that had powered them through Volume 1 curdled into acrimony in the making of Volume 2. Julia and Zika were quite a pair. They were both tall, strong-willed women who married suave older men, were childless, drove like outlaws, and held strong opinions. They called each other sister, and they loved each other and fought like blood relatives. This is an Arnold Newman photograph taken right after Julia Sunka had a terrible fight at La Pichun. Note the look in 
and Sita's eyes. How Julia leans away from her, and particularly the row of sharp knives on the wall between them. While Julia was a logical, steady workhorse, Simka was a more intuitive and capricious artist who complained that certain recipes were all wrong, even when they had been her own suggestions. Julia was patient with this at first, but as the book dragged on years past their deadline, Judith Jones drew a red line. Julia put her head down, ignored Simka's daily diatribes, worked herself to the point of exhaustion, and managed to finish volume two at the 11th hour. Consoling Simka afterwards, she wrote, it may not be the book of your dreams, ma chérie, but it will be done. Well, the book was done, and so last was their collaboration, though they remained close friends the rest of their lives. Simka considered herself the better cook and resented Julia's celebrity, an American phenomenon she didn't really understand. And Julia was fed up with Simka's tirades, but more importantly, wanted to break out of the straitjacket of French cuisine and try new things. The question was, what did that mean? By the spring of 1971, Mastery Volume 2 was selling well, but reaction to Season 2 of the French Chef was underwhelming. It seemed that the public was growing bored of French food and the French Chef. They were ready to try Italian, Chinese, Brazilian, Middle Eastern, and Mexican foods instead. Ironically, the gastronomic curiosity that Julia had unleashed now threatened to doom her. She was perplexed and wrote Judith Jones, are we trying to be too technical or booky? Are we losing the fun because we are too complicated in talking? I am quite aware there comes a time when one is frankly out of style, out of step, and had better fold up and steal away. I shall not do macrobiotics and vegetarianism, however. <laughs> Characteristically, Julia decided to write her way out of trouble. <coughs> this time, Judith Jones, who's there on the far right, urged her to use the first person. This would bring Julia's distinctive voice from TV to the page and provide a more intimate tone. But there was just one problem. <coughs> Despite being a charismatic and natural performer, Julia was a modest person who hated to talk about herself. She struggled for months, but eventually, with help from Paul and Judith, managed to craft a series of first-person narratives studded with recipes, each one structured as a mini cooking class. For the first time in her career, she embraced Indian curry, Greek moussaka, New England fish chowder, microwave ovens, salad spinners, and Teflon pans. She told personal stories and recalled formative taste memories, such as the day in 1926 when she was 14 years old and watched Caesar Cardini prepare his famous Caesar salad in Tijuana, Mexico. Her favorite part of the meal? When the chef encouraged her to eat the salad with her fingers. <laughs> I'm sure this explains why Julia insisted that we eat asparagus with our fingers, saying it tastes better that way, <laughs> much to our parents' chagrin. One of Julia's most endearing traits was her ability to admit failure. In the Tart Tatin show, for example, she flipped the apple, apple dessert upside down out of its hand, but instead of a beautiful caramelized confection, she produced a puddle of beige mush. Well, that's a little loose, she said in alarm. To save the day, she scooped the mush together, sifted powdered sugar over it, ran it under the broiler, and reassured her viewers, it's okay because you can show your guests how clever you are by fixing everything up. <laughs> What people didn't know was that Julia was a closet perfectionist. And I can tell you that years later, when she and I were working on her memoir together, she was still annoyed by that tart tatin. 
And she would mutter conspiratorially from time to time that the Cortland apple she used must have been mislabeled, as if someone was trying to sabotage her. In the fall of 1974, Julie was making great progress on her new book, performing on television and lecturing around the country, when Paul was suddenly rushed into the hospital for a heart bypass operation. It did not go well. The oxygen was starved to his brain, leaving him with, with, with what he called the mental scrambles. It was a terrible blow. Paul was Julia's mentor, culinary guinea pig, chief dishwasher, staff photographer, business manager, and best friend. And now he could barely move or speak. It was torture, the most difficult time in their marriage. My poor husband, he who took such pride in lifting heavy suitcases and felling massive trees, hated to be so weak and confused, Julie wrote. So do I. She canceled her busy schedule and withdrew from the public realm to care for him. Eventually, eventually she found solace in work and, once again, drove herself to utter exhaustion to finish the new book. And thank heavens I did, she'd say. Without a challenging cookbook to work on, I could well have gone cuckoo in those dark months. Published in 1975, the new book was called From Julia Child's Kitchen. And thankfully, it was a hit. By then, Paul was slowly mending, and Julia was able to do a short book tour and interact with her fans again, which was a bomb to her battered soul. By the following summer of 1976, she was back in action, at the White House with President Ford and the Queen, cooking up a primordial soup in her kitchen and hosting us at La Pichun. With the benefit of hindsight, I now see that this was the moment she embarked on her second act. Now, having found her voice, Julia decided to use it rather loudly. She wrote for mass market publications like McCall's and Bourdain. She disparaged nutritionists as the fat police. <laughs> she demonstrated how to kill a lobster, suggested eating rabbit, greedily munched down McDonald's french fries cooked in beef tallow, and questioned whether the cuisine was really as healthy and revolutionary as its promoters insisted, all of which sent up howls of protest. Though she disliked being labeled a feminist, Julia was a proud liberal Democrat who supported Planned Parenthood, and she empowered women and plenty of men across the country with her message. Work hard, learn your technique, take risks, don't apologize for your failures, and above all, have fun. Food is love. Her new outspokenness brought Julia new attention and critics. Madeleine Kamen, a French-born American cook, derided Julia as neither French nor a chef. <laughs> and the food writers, John and Karen Hess, sneered that Julia was not a cook, though she plays one on TV. <laughs> Julia ignored them in public. But in private, she seemed to channel Sweeney Todd, the demon barber, when she said she'd like to grind Kamen up in her greasy <laughs> In the late 1970s, Julia was paid perhaps the ultimate American compliment when she was spooked on TV. First, as Julia grown up by the electric company, and then, of course, by Dan Aykroyd on Saturday Night Live. Aykroyd told me that he revered Julia and that she inspired two skits. It is crazy bastomatic sketch in 76, there on the left, and of course, his bloody save the liver impersonation. <laughs> he wrote that one with Al Franken in 1978. And it helped divine Dan, the show, and to this day, Julia Child in the public imagination. That same year, 78, Julia created Julia Child and Company. And in 79, Julia Child and More Company. They were big 
colorful menu books full of time-saving tips and advice on everything from how to bake beans in a hole you dig in your backyard <laughs> to locale delights and the superiority of the metric system. The accompanying TV shows were equally ambitious, but never found a large audience. Though she rarely complained about anything, not even her mastectomy in 1968, Julia sensed that PBS was taking her for granted. We just killed ourselves on the company shows, but PBS, I don't know whether they forgot we taped it or what, but the shows never got on the air in many places, she thundered. Fed up, Julia quit PBS and joined ABC's commercial show, Good Morning America. It was a difficult transition because she had to condense her usual half hour episodes into three minute sound bites. But she eventually adapted and, true to form, found a bigger audience than ever on GMA. This was her apotheosis, when Julia was at the height of her powers. Now, Julia Child was not the first TV chef or solely responsible for the American food revolution, but she was America's first celebrity TV chef. Some called her a pioneer. I think of her as a revolutionary in pearls. She created a new model for what cooks could do and food could be, and she got the public talking about eating in a new way. People often ask me, what would she say about today's 24-7 culinary circus? Well, I think she'd have mixed feelings, to be honest. On the one hand, she would, be, she would have deep reservations about the glitz and glam of it all. She thought of cooking as a civilized art and loved it for its camaraderie and creativity, not for the faux competitions and soap opera melodramas. <laughs> On the other hand, she would be thrilled to know that many more Americans than ever consider themselves foodies today and are eating with gusto, which was one of her favorite phrases. In 1979, Julia wrote to Simca, I'm really getting tired of all the greasing brouhaha, jockeying for place and prestige. I think we were lucky, you and I, to be in at the beginning. Oof. Here's a little section at the end of the book, which I think kind of sums Julia up in, a, in an odd way. This is a section called Child's Play. Throughout her career, journalists often like to note how childlike Julia Child could be, and how she loved to play with food. And it was true. Her audience laughed when she dropped a potato pancake on the stove, then scooped it back into the pan, saying, when you're low in the kitchen, who's to know? <laughs> That's a terrible accent I did, I'm sorry. <laughs> she flirted with David Letterman while blowtorching a raw hamburger. <laughs> made linking double entendres on Good Morning America, and summoned Jacques Pepin to the stove with a honking duck call. <laughs> she encouraged this vision of childlike play to a point, but it could be misleading. As Paul knowingly observed, practically every article on Julia has concentrated on the clown instead of the woman, the cook, the expert, or the revolutionary. There was another Julia, one who saw something deeper, more profound, and mysterious in our ability to turn raw ingredients into something delicious to eat, and how life-altering that experience can be. I was reminded of this when I happened to glance at a postscript in Julia Child and Company. It was a short, easily overlooked aside, titled, On Playing With Your Food. I read it expecting to laugh. Yet something about it, the tone, the celebration of cooking as art, the encouragement and inclusiveness of its message caught my attention. I read it again, and then again. And I realized that Julia's light-hearted title masked a heartfelt cri de cour, one that makes a fitting epitaph. She wrote, some children like to make castles out of their rice pudding, or faces with raisins for eyes. 
It is forbidden so sternly that when they grow up, they take a horrid revenge by dyeing meringues pale blue or baking birthday cakes in the form of horseshoes or liars or whatnot. That is not playing with food. That is trifling. Play to me means freedom and delight, as in the phrase, play of imagination. If cooks did not enjoy speculating about new possibilities in every method and each raw material, their art would stagnate and they would become rote performers, not creators. True cooks love to set one flavor against another. Uh, sorry, one against another in the imagination to experiment with the great wealth of fresh produce in the supermarkets, to bake what they previously they braved, to try new devices. We all have flops, of course, but we learn from them. And when an invention or variation works out at last, it is an enormous pleasure to propose it to our fellows. Let's all play with our food, I say, and in so doing, let us advance the state of the art together. Now, uh, normally I would end my talk here, but uh, today I have a special treat for you. Um, I'm going to give you a sneak preview of a brand new book that will be published on October 24th. Now, in 2006, we illustrated my life in France with Paul Giles' evocative black and white photographs of their lives together in France. And since then, people often ask me, um, they say, I just love those pictures. Have you ever thought of doing a book about Paul? Well, the answer was always yes. And now I can say, as a matter of fact, I have done that book. It's called France is a Beast, The Photographic Journey of Paul and Julia Child. This includes 225 of Paul's photos, most of which have not been seen before. I wrote the text, and my friend Katie Pratt selected the images. France is a Feast is a visual extension of Julia's memoir, but it tells the story from Paul's side, and that is quite a tale. As he said, if variety is the spice of life, then I have led a curry of life. Briefly, Paul and Charlie were born in 1902 and raised around Boston. Their father was a brilliant engineer who died when they were just four months old. Their mother was a beautiful, if impractical, singer who could barely control the rambunctious twins. They were bright and creative and got into all sorts of trouble. Charlie attended Harvard and Paul Columbia until the money ran out, and he became an itinerant laborer and adventurer. In the 1920s, Paul lived in Paris and worked as a tutor and artist. He became fluent in French, a gourmet, and knew Ernest Hemingway and Gertrude Stein. In the 1930s, he lived in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and fell in love with an older, divorced woman, Edith Kennedy, who gave him entree to the sophisticated crowd he aspired to. They lived happily in sin until she died of heart disease in 1942. Feeling bereft, Paul joined the OSS, the precursor to the CIA which sent him to Sri Lanka to design the secret war rooms for Lord Mountbatten. There he met the willowy Julia Big Williams, a six foot two inch clerk typist from Pasadena. She was 10 years his junior, wore size 12 sneakers, <laughs> concocted a recipe for shark repellent, and loved to eat. They bonded over books and food. When they moved to Paris in 1948, Paul's job at the U.S. Embassy was to host cultural events, a show of Frank Lloyd Wright's drawings, films about the Marshall Plan, or exhibits of, Ed of Edward Weston's photographs to help win hearts and minds during the Cold War. Off-duty, Julia called him the mad photographer, because Paul rarely left the house without at least one or two, and sometimes three, cameras slung around his neck. She would often accompany him and would use her tall body and long arm to shield his lens from the sun. <laughs> Years later, Julia would recall, Paris was wonderfully walkable 
And it was a natural subject for Paul because it had everything you could want. Romance, practicality, and people that were colorful and lively. When one follows the artist's eye, one sees unexpected treasures in so many seemingly ordinary scenes. Paul taught me to appreciate things that I would have otherwise just skimmed over or missed. He caught the spirit of the city, and you could feel his love for the subjects. Paul's eye was drawn to portraits, reflections and refractions, landscapes. That's Marseille from their apartment. Architectural compositions. That's you know who at the top of the stairs there. <laughs> Abstractions. And of course, his long legged wife <laughs> at work and at play. At heart, these two books, The French Chef in America and France is a Feast, are two sides of a single and singular love story. Paul and Julia's love of food, photography, friends, and family, and most of all, each other. <laughs> their relationship was remarkable, even by modern standards. For the first half of their marriage, Paul was the senior member who tutored the ingenue Julia about food, wine, sex, and culture. But when he retired in 1961, he pushed her forward, just as she published Mastering the Art of French Cooking. This timely role reversal is reminiscent of My Fair Lady, the story of a charismatic apprentice who supersedes her one-time master, with Paul emulating Henry Higgins and Julia Eliza Doolittle. Paul described their marital flip-flop as nature restoring an upset balance. In his photographs of Julia and her writings about Paul, you can see how they relied on and needed each other, and why they referred to themselves as two sides of a coin. Without Julia, I would be a miserable misanthrope, he said. She could charm a whole cat. Without Paul, Julia wrote, I would never have had my career. Their life together truly was a feast. And to that, they would raise a glass and say, Bon appétit. <laughs> Thank you.
developing her palate, uh, she really saw uh, food, as the French call it, as a combination of high art and competitive sport. And this really appealed to her. Uh, and that's why she always said, you have to really learn your technique. You have to work hard. Uh, you know, when she was developing recipes, she would try each one 10 or 12 times to make sure that she worked out all the kinks so that her readers wouldn't have to. Uh, Simca, of course, would just do it once and toss it off, and uh, <laughs> that's where there was a little tension between them. Uh, but the answer is that Julia was a real workhorse, um, and she loved that. Uh, she'd say, you have to be rough and tough with that baguette. Smash that dough around. Uh, yeah, well, she was a big physical woman, she, and she really enjoyed the hard work. So I think uh, Jacques Alain was here last week. Yes. And as you probably know, Jacques and Julia had a wonderful uh, competitive relationship. Um, and that tension you see on television was real. They were really elbowing each other. And, uh, uh, you know, she wanted to do it her way, and he wanted to do it his way. Um, and that's what made it such great television. Yes? I, I just wanted to share a little memory, because I, I was converted to gourmet cooking by Julia Child. And um, I lived in Cambridge at the time they were living there. And when I discovered she went to Savonars, I would go to Savonars and I occasionally would see her there. And I'm 5'1". I'm so <laughs> and she was 6'2 plus. Yeah. I, would, I would toddle behind her and listen to see if she said, what kind of water are you having today? <laughs> but and then, then I uh, went to a, a taping at GBA. And she was doing zoomies. Ah, so excellent. Wonderful, wonderful memories. And I thank you for all your lovely words. Well, my pleasure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Savonar's Market is a famous place in Cambridge where Julia used to shop. And I have many Savonar stories, but the one that yours reminds me of was another woman who was a little bit petite, uh, who was following Julia around at Savonar's. Uh, no, actually, she was standing at Savonar's. And somebody ran into her with a shopping cart into the back of her leg. She said, ouch! And she turned around and looked up, and there was Julia. <laughs> and uh, Julia was busy, didn't even know she went into this woman. Uh, and then the woman followed her around and bought everything that Julia bought. <laughs> on autopilot. And got home and opened her grocery bag, and it was this crazy mishmash of things. She said, I don't know what to do with this. <laughs> so, yes? How close did Meryl Streep come to the train um, well, I was an advisor on that movie, and actually an extra for a very brief scene, and I got to know her a little bit. And she very um, interestingly said that she was playing Julie Powell's fantasy version of Julia Child. So it was sort of two steps removed from the actual Julia. Having said that, I think she did a remarkable job in that role. And as I said, Meryl was one of Julia's favorite movie actresses. Julia and I used to go see movies all the time. She was a big movie fan. And so I think she would have been thrilled to see Meryl playing her. Um, and it's a difficult role because Meryl in life is about this tall, and Julia was like this. While Stanley Tucci, who played Paul, who was like this high, is actually tall and So they had to adjust their height. And one of the things you might notice when you see that movie again is, her, uh, is Meryl's physicality. She moves like a big person. And she plays this big, open-hearted woman. And personally, I think she should have won an Academy Award for that. Uh, but I was told that because it was her part was only half the movie, they didn't consider that worthy of an Oscar. Uh, but I think uh, she did a remarkable job of channeling the spirit of Julia. And I don't think it was an exact reproduction. Because Julia was very subtle. If you really watch her, you listen to her, it, it's almost impossible to reproduce that. She operates in her own kind of crazy way, using words that other people don't use, and, and, and that her voice, and, and even her pearls and her, and her sneakers. I mean, she just was sui generis. And, um, uh, but I think Meryl got the spirit of Julia, which was no mean feat. Anyone else? Yes? You were a young boy growing up, so you went to the events and she Cooked, right? Yeah. So, what was your most memorable or not memorable, like, like being a young boy and her being your, your great aunt? Well, uh, I have two answers to that. So, the first is that I never took an official cooking class with Julia, uh, but I learned a lot by osmosis just by standing next to her in the kitchen. And this would happen at her place in Cambridge, or at my parents in New York 
city, up in Maine, where we have the house. And so I learned to make omelets, the French way. I had a whole way of learning, of teaching you how to flip uh, beans as practice for flipping the omelet. Uh, and of course, the beans would go flying all over the place. You thought that was hilarious. Uh, so as a kid, you think, wow, cooking's fun, right? But we learned how to make, uh, I learned, made uh, lace cookies and blueberry pie and, and chowder and mane and, um, so you, you know. Um, well, I'll get to that in a second, so that's part two. Uh, I think one of the most memorable things, I, when I was about 10 years old, we went to Cambridge to the Childs for Thanksgiving, and she produced, she brought out a pumpkin and put it in the middle of the table. And then she opened the pumpkin and she made pumpkin soup with lots of cream, of course. Uh, and when she served in the pumpkin. And so as a kid, that made a huge impression. Part two of the answer is that uh, the, the child would often come down to New York to do TV shows or demonstrations, and they would sometimes stay with us in our apartment. And we would watch that Julia, uh, French chef, on our little black and white TV, and you'd see her there, and then she'd appear in person in the kitchen, and your little kid would think, oh, cool, you know, she just walked out of the TV. <laughs> And eventually, I began to understand that, uh, that she was a celebrity and that she was this wonderful cook. And uh, we would often go out for dinner. And a restaurant would always put you in the middle of the dining room at the biggest table, and people would start to come up and talk to her. Uh, one of my favorite memories of that was uh, a night when we were at a restaurant, and there were two women sitting over on the side, talking away. And they suddenly realized that Julia Child was there, and one woman went into, oh, Julia! And she knocked over the candle, which then lit the tablecloth on fire. <laughs> flames are going out, and the waiters come and are dousing it, and the poor woman was completely mortified. And Julia said, oh, don't worry about it. And over, she signed a napkin for her. Which was very enjoyable. And then, we would always go back after the meal into the kitchen. And she would literally talk to every single person in the kitchen. And she would start with the head chef. And she generally knew his story, and she would be polite and so on, and she'd work her way down the line uh, through the poissonnier to the salad woman to the dessert uh, person to the dishwasher. And it was the dishwasher that she was most interested in because she kind of knew everybody's story, but she really wanted to know uh, how this person who came from India or Mexico and ended up in this restaurant. Um, and she would fire off questions at them, you know, who are you, where did you come from, how did you end up here? And it was genuine, you know, she was really curious. And I think that was one of her defining characteristics, which her great curiosity. And a little footnote to that story is, when we were working on our memoir together in Santa Barbara, uh, we used to go to the movies. So one night we went to see this movie called Calendar Girls. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and at that point, Julia was in a wheelchair. She had a bad knee, couldn't walk. So after the movie, I had to park her on the corner and go get the car, which was across the street. So I was gone for 30 seconds. I come back in the car, and there's Julia um, firing questions at a guy, a homeless guy she just met on the street. Who are you? Where did you come from? How did you get here? You know, same questions. Uh, a few days after that, the phone rings, and it's someone from the Bush White House announcing that she's won the Presidential Medal of Freedom. What did she say? Who are you? How did you get there? Optimistic, can do uh, spirit was his probably her most lasting legacy for me. Wow. Well, thank you all very much.